Good morning. I'm coming to you from my spare bedroom sitting at my desk. And I want to talk to you about something I believe is very important. And it's the fact that you are unique and I am unique. There's no one else in the world that's like us. God made us and he said that even when we were formed in the belly, before we were formed in the belly, he knew us. And the Bible says that we were chosen in him before the foundations of the world. And then we stop to think of it. We read in the book of Revelation in chapter 4, one of the last verses in chapter 4, says that all things were created by him and for him and for his pleasure they exist. So in a sense, the word is saying that you and I were created for the very purpose of bringing God pleasure. And I look back over my life and I think of, have I brought him pleasure in my life? Have I talked to him? Have I walked with him? Have I worshipped with him? Have I thanked him for all the things that he has given me and allowed me to do? Then I stop and think of all the places I went that I should not have, all the things I said I should not have. And then I look back over years and years of my life that were wasted but then I think that it, the Bible tells me that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And Jesus said, he is the life. When the rich young ruler came to him and said, Master, what should I do to get eternal life? And Jesus said, well, what does the law say? And he answered him. He said, you should love the Lord with all your heart and you should love your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus said, you said correctly. And the young man said, well, I've done all these since the day I was born. You know, I've done this all my life. And Jesus said, one thing you lack. Sell all that you have and come, give it to the poor and come and follow me. And then it says the rich young ruler went away. And did he not know that Jesus said that I am the way. I am the life. I am the resurrection. And so he was not willing to part with what he had accumulated in this world. And Jesus would have provided for all of his needs not necessarily all of his wants, but all of his needs. And he says he wanted us to have faith in him. Now, with this virus that we're, we have here in the world, and we call it a pandemic, this is not the first time that something like this has happened in the world. It's happened many times before. Sometimes it's for discipline as God is trying to get their attention. And sometimes it's just a natural occurrence in history of the way things are because of the sin that's in the world. And it seems to be that this virus is devastating a lot of people because they are losing a lot of their accumulated wealth in the stock market. And it seems to be crippling a lot of different societies. And some nations even are going to go broke. But we have to realize that there is nothing in this world that is eternal except for the presence of the Holy Spirit. He is the only thing that is eternal in this world. Because God said eventually everything in this world is going to be burned up. And our purpose as a unique people, he said, because 
We were fearfully and wonderfully made. That's what we read in the book of Psalms. Psalms 139 is very unique in the way that it describes everything we do, everything we have, every thought we think, God is there. So now that we are believers, those of us who have accepted Christ as our Savior, many of us have not really yielded to him as our Lord. And now, I have a letter here, and it's from America's Prayer Network. And they go on explaining what they want to accomplish, and they're sending out this petition, but then they're asking for money to help them get this bill that they're writing passed. But I want to call one thing here to your attention. I want to read this little piece of paper they have in bold print. And it says, emergency, coronavirus has almost wiped us out financially. Contributions have dried up. We desperately need all Americans to step forward right now, and that's big, bold letters, for we face the real prospect of going out of business. Our situation is very dire. We know everyone is under stress today, but we have no one else to turn to. Please help with whatever you can afford. Thank you and stay safe. Now, that seems okay on the surface, but I want to point out that last sentence. But we have no one else to turn to. They didn't mention prayer in this thing once. They have God to turn to. And that's what I want to talk about. A lot of times, we as Christians... We say, oh, where is God with all of these terrible things that are happening in the world? They're fighting overseas. Many wars are going on. They're liable to come here. The virus is attacking us. Many people are dying. And God says that he has no pleasure in the death of the wicked. He says, but he does have pleasure in the death of his saints because they will be with him in glory. But we're coming up, I think it's May the 7th this year, is what is called the National Day of Prayer. Now, back in 1863, in the fall, on Thanksgiving, this was declared a national holiday for Thanksgiving by Abraham Lincoln. Then later on, Harry Truman, in 1952, made the National Day of Prayer in the spring. And so he declared it to be a national day that would recur every year. And now this year, the National Day of Prayer, the official one, is going to be in May the 7th. Now Donald Trump, when he took office and this coronavirus came up on March the 15th of 2020 he stood there and he said I the president of the United States do declare this day that would be March the 15th as a national day of prayer to combat the coronavirus now here people were scared and threatened and all of a sudden they shut down the system and that gave all of the Christians an opportunity to go in their closet, get on their knees, make things right with them and with the Lord and to pray. And this is the time that we should all pray for God's will to be done, not only in our life, but also in the lives of our loved ones and our friends and our neighbors. And many times we say, when someone tells us of a situation they're going through, we'll say, oh, I'll pray for you. 
I'll pray for you. And I'm beginning to think more and more when someone tells me about a situation they're going through, instead of saying, I will pray for you, we ought to pray right then and right there so they will see our prayer and they will know that we are concerned. But when I just say, I'll pray for you, I'll get home and maybe a couple hours later, I'll forget all about it. And that seems to be Satan's ploy of getting us to forget <laughs> all about the blessings that God wants to give us when we pray for one another, when we minister to one another. So I want to just encourage you to realize that this virus is not here to destroy you. This virus is here for God only knows why, but it could be for the very reason that he wants us to get right because some people say, oh, this is the beginning of the tribulation. Oh, the world's going to end. Or is this going to start off the battle of Armageddon that's supposed to come at the end times? And we can't know that for sure. But the thing is, we know that God has a purpose in allowing this to happen. And it's all over the world. Now, people will say, well, the Jews over there are surrounded by the very nation that are supposed to come against them in the end times. There's Russia, there's Turkey, there's Iran, there's Syria. And so they're all surrounding him over in Jerusalem. Then the Jews are saying, we want to build a third temple. And they've got all of the utensils all ready to go. And some say over there, they're looking for their Messiah. And they believe their Messiah is already alive somewhere in the world today. But they are still have the blinds over their eyes so they can't see or understand the Messiah has already come. And the one that they think is going to be their Messiah is going to be the Antichrist. And so at this time, when we go to this day of prayer, and we don't have to wait for that day of prayer. We should be on our knees every day that this virus is here. And matter of fact, there is a group of evangelical Christians and Christian churches that have formed the league, and they are calling it the 714 prayer. They want people to unite with them at 7. 14 in the morning and 7 14 at night and so they want to pray for the world pray for themselves that they would have a right standing with God there would be no unconfessed sin in their life and that they would be able to come before God with nothing holding them back and that they would say Lord we want you to heal our land. And he says, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves, call upon me, turn from their sin and seek my face, I will hear them and I will answer them and I will heal their land. So for one thing we should pray for, is that God would heal us and heal our land. And then we think, oh, at this time, there people are celebrating the victory of those who have come out of the Holocaust. But many of them are suffering again because they're up in age and they're feeble and they are in very poor health and they have hardly any type of an income. And we could be praying for them that God would provide for their needs and also pro provide for the protection of Israel because he has promised that he would bless them that bless Israel and he would take care of them who care for the weak and the poor and the down and outers. So this is a time that we could really focus not on ourselves and, oh, poor me, I'm going through all of this trial and I can't go anywhere. I can't go shopping. I can't do this. I can't do that. But we said, oh, there's no greater blessing than to be able to go before God and say, God, 
I thank you for this opportunity that I can minister just here from my house. And the Bible says, the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous person avails much. And so we have to realize that God said we were chosen for his glory. And we were chosen unto good works. Not that we want to work for our salvation, but after we have been saved, we pray for those who aren't, that they might come to the knowledge of the truth, that they might accept Jesus as their Savior. They might have the privilege of having eternal life. And we say, we might not see the results of our prayers, but Jesus was telling a story in the New Testament, and he said that this lady had some visitors come, and she didn't have any food. And so she went to this judge and said, will you help me? Provide for me. Give me what I need for these. And he said, oh, man, this woman is driving me crazy. He said, but, so, but because of her situation, he said, I don't fear God. I don't fear anything. But because this woman is in this situation, I'm going to provide for her need. And he did. And that's what he is saying. He wants us, not that we're going to weary God. I think many times we weary God because we don't ask for assistance. We don't ask for the help of other people. And so he says, you will find me when you search for me with all of your heart. And he says, the word is near you. It's even in your mouth. It's, you don't have to go very far to find it. I'm sure you have a Bible in your house somewhere. And he says, call on me and I will answer you and show you great and mighty things which you don't know about. And a lot of times we pray but we really don't believe that God's going to do anything. And we have to realize that Jesus said, without faith, it's impossible to please God. So in the book of Hebrews, the writer of the book of Hebrews goes through this whole list of names of people who it says, by faith, Abraham did this. By faith, Lot did this. By faith, Jonah did this. Well, you know, they were just average people. You know, there was nothing spectacular about them. If you go back and read their lives, you will find out <laughs> that some of them were arrogant, some of them were proud, and some of them were liars, and some of them were murderers, and some of them were connivers, just manipulating people. But because they believed in God, you know, they realized that God would do them good even when they made these blunders in their life. And so you ought to read the 11th chapter of Hebrews and see by faith, by faith, by faith. And so if you ask God according to his will, he will hear you and he will answer you. And so my prayer for you is that you would pray for me as I'll be praying for you and that you would pray for other people that you know that are in need. I think of the people that are in the concentration camps and in the uh, camps where the refugee camps they are subject to this virus and for them it's almost impossible to have the safe distance of six feet. So pray for those people that they might be able to find relief from these, this disease. You know, in the Old Testament, when the people were getting ready to leave Egypt, there was a death angel that went through. And it says, when I see the blood... 
I will pass over you. Because the Jewish people sprinkled the house of the blood of the sacrificed lamb that was to cover their sins until the real sacrifice, Jesus, came to die on the cross to get rid of their sins. He said, when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And so we as Christians should be praying fervently for those people who are out there in danger all the time. And the best thing you could do is to pray for their salvation. And a lot of people say, oh, I don't need that, you know, salvation. You know, you looking for pie in the sky. But it says the God of this world has blinded their minds, lest they should see with their eyes and believe in their heart. And then they would accept them. And so one of the greatest things you could do is fervently pray for those people in those refugee camps. Pray for those little children that are starving. This is an opportune time to have your faith grow. And especially pray for things, little things you can start off with where you know you can see the reward when it comes. You can see this happen. Now, many of you know Betty Evans, and she was there a member of the church for a long time, and she passed on. But every time someone would, would have a prayer request, she would write it down in the journal, a little journal. And so then she made this whole book of people that she was praying for and what she was praying for and when she heard that that prayer was answered. And then after she passed away, her son had this journal and he was reading through it and it just blessed his heart to see the prayer list of his mother and how so many prayers have been answered. And as we look back on our life, we say, oh, he didn't answer very many prayers for me. But if you would just sit back, ask him, Lord, show me, where were you in my life when this happened? Where were you in my life when that happened? And you will see, little by little, that he led you all the way. And even through your trials and tribulations and difficulties, when you were so upset, you said, I can't pray. I don't have the strength to pray. But he was with you through that. And he said, yea, though I go through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. And so one of the important things to know, the closer you are to the Lord, the less fear you'll have in your heart. It says, because perfect love casts out fear. And so the closer we draw to the Lord, the more of his love and protection we can feel. So I want to encourage you, most of all, for your own benefit, that you would stay close to the Lord, lift up your hands and worship him because you are fearfully and wonderfully made. And most of all, you have to realize that if you are a born-again believer, that you've accepted Christ as your Savior, that you have the presence of the Holy Spirit living within you. And it says, I don't care what men can do unto me. I know that if I live my life the way that I should to glorify God, that he will protect me, he will keep me, and he says he will guide me in the way which I should go. So that's my word for you today, is to love the Lord, keep looking up, because I believe that he's coming soon. I'm not going to say a date or a time. It could be this year, it could be next year, but it will be soon. And to him, remember, a day is a thousand years, and a thousand years is a day. So be ready to go at any moment, because we don't know what a day is going to bring forth. Even if it brings destruction of our economy, even if it brings death right to our doorstep, we know that he has told us that we are more than conquerors through him who loved us and gave himself for us. So keep looking up, keep praying, and we will get through this together. So I want you to know, remember May the 7th, 
2020. It's called the International Day of Prayer. And people are going to be, even now, they're at 714 in the morning and 714 at night. There are thousands and thousands of Christians that are praying. And many believe that even through this desperate time we're going through, when we come out of it, there's going to be a great revival of young people who have come to put their trust in God, and they will have eternal life. And if you are one of those prayer warriors, you will have a great blessing for you, waiting for you when you stand in the presence of the Lord. So don't say, oh, I can't do anything. You can pray. That's one of the most important things you can do is to pray. So I thank you for listening to this. And I thank you that you love the Lord Jesus enough to sit through a half an hour of my rambling. But it's not the preacher that does anything. He says, we plant the word and then the Holy Spirit will take that word, apply it to your heart, and then it's up to you to make that choice. So thank you again, and hopefully we'll see you soon. God bless you, I love you, and Jesus loves you more. Give him thanks for your salvation. Amen. <laughs>